everyday witches emerge from the shadows of secrecy. Broom closets are flinging open and witches are taking flight. Whether you are hiding in your cozy closet or flying with pride, stay for a spell as witch casting with Theodora Pendragon and her guests share magical moments, stir the cauldron and debunk misinformation and misconceptions about paganism, witches and our wonderful world of magic. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have a special guest, Nicole Luna, and she's a psychic medium, and she is a witch living in Salem, Massachusetts. Welcome, Nicole Luna. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know too many witches who live in Salem, So you're my first guest on this podcast who actually lives in Salem. Were you made in Salem? (laughs) No, I was not made in Salem. Um, I'm originally from Toronto, um, but opened Modern Magic, which is an event space, a space that's really targeted towards providing authentic ritual experiences to witches and curious people who are visiting town and also locals here. We seem to have about a 50-50 split of the people who tend to come out and visit. Some are locals and some are visitors. You must have lots of tourists there. October especially is kind of uh, chaos around town. Whenever people find out I live in Salem, they often want to know, like, when's the best time to visit? And I usually say, not October. And I know that's, like, such a disappointing answer for a lot of people because they want that, like, beautiful New England sort of, like, magic of uh, Halloween and and the autumn and all of that, but it's really super duper crowded. And in my opinion, that there's just so many amazing times to visit town. October is like the tip of the of a very big iceberg of what you can find in Salem. And what sometimes can happen is people can, uh, I think, get lost in the crazy of tourists. Uh, we saw over a million tourists come into to town last October alone. And uh, we're a small town of 40,000 people. So it's, it was a pretty big, <laughs> it was a pretty big feeling, I guess, that came over Salem, especially on the weekends in October. One million. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The number of people, one million in a big city can't possibly fit inside Little Salem. No. And in fact, some of the local government were encouraging people to not drive into town because we just didn't have the parking capacity for it. Um, Even cell service was kind of down at one point last October. (laughs) Just too many people in town trying to trying to access the uh, cell service. But it's all fun for sure. I love October. It's a special kind of crazy, a special kind of madness. But if you're coming to town looking for like a really authentic, beautiful kind of historical experience and not just Halloween, then I recommend visiting outside of October. But witches don't only come out during Halloween. Definitely not. Not especially not in Salem. (laughs) Do you see a lot of witches around town throughout the year or do you usually only see them dressed up as witches during October? Um, I think that depends, right? Like there are definitely people in town that have a specific way of presenting themselves and, you know, that has to do with their magical practice and maybe certain traditions that they like to follow. And I definitely see people around town throughout the year wearing certain types of dress You'll see more elaborate costumes and more elaborate kind of dress in October, definitely. Uh, But Salem has a huge magical community, so many different magical traditions, whether it's witchcraft or ceremonial magic, people who are into different types of magic and uh, different occult systems. It's a pretty supportive and also very vast magical community that we have here, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. Did you have that when you were in Canada? 
Unfortunately not. Um, you know, I did have, I think, a lot of really good resources that were accessible to me online. And a lot of there was a lot of local events that would happen once or twice a year, um, different like pagan festivals. And we had um, the Wiccan Church of Canada that hosts public and open rituals. And that was such a beautiful resource for a lot of people, but even people who aren't Wiccan just to be able to participate in something. Right. But yeah, it was definitely a choose your own adventure experience. I think um, living in Canada, a little bit less in terms of resources. There's definitely a lot more here. How did you decide to move to Salem and open this business? Yeah. So I had been visiting Salem for a really long time um, with like witchy girlfriends and stuff. We'd come out. We loved coming out in the summer because Salem's a nice seaside town and there's a lot of beautiful beaches close by. So um, so that's my favorite time still in town. But what I had noticed when coming into town as a practicing witch and with a whole lot of um, anticipation about Salem being this like spiritual Mecca, this place where like, if I couldn't find it at home, I will definitely find it in Salem. What I noticed is that there wasn't as much, there are offerings for people who are legitimately interested in magic and, and legitimately interested in authentic experiences, but they were really kind of hard to find. You really had to search for them. You would have to kind of like wait for special events throughout the year to kind of come up and happen. And I was looking for a safe space where I could practice magic with other people and learn and couldn't really find it. So when the opportunity came to move, um, which it did, we at first, my husband and I were not sure if it was, we weren't sure right away if it was going to be Salem. We were kind of interested in different parts of New England. And then I had been operating a successful business where I was already teaching about magic and witchcraft and um, also a practicing psychic medium. And I thought, you know, this is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to have this experience. And when we thought maybe Salem might be our place, we thought we would open this space and try to bring in a really special kind of uh, safe space for people to practice magic and for people to feel like they could experience something authentic no matter where they were kind of visiting from. And yeah, interestingly, as I had mentioned, it's about 50-50. We have a lot of locals that come in as well. I had gone to Whole Foods one day and I was just chatting with the cashier there. And it was during Halloween and I had my witch hat on. And the lady said, oh, I used to see a lot of that when I lived in Salem. <laughs> And I asked her, I said, so are you a witch? And she said, oh, no, I would never go to that part of town. That's their thing. It's not my thing. But, oh, oh, okay. oh, okay. Well, I won't talk to you about anything, you know, witchy then. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. Someone who was originally from Salem, Massachusetts, really didn't assimilate to that witchy culture. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't met too many people like that, but probably because I am like a very public witch. So like I'm not my friend group and my acquaintances don't really include people who are not like super excited about um, magic or at least very respectful of my beliefs. But I think definitely we have to remember the history of this place and the fact that it was founded on Puritan values and that there are people who have been living in different parts of New England for, you know, generations, families who've been here for a long time and just don't get it. <laughs> and I do feel I am in like a couple of like social media groups for for locals and I do hear a lot of groaning about October and a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of people who who are really kind of frustrated by um, the fact that a place that has such a dark history of being an unsafe location um, not that the the people who were accused in the trials were actually witches, but obviously there's a an overlap there now has become this safe haven, not just for for magical practitioners, but from for all kinds of unusual people. You know, we have a really big artists community here, and it's just kind of like Salem has become this place. I think where you can really, I was going to say, let your freak flag fly in the sense of like really being yourself and taking on that most authentic version of yourself. And yeah, not everybody is going to be <laughs> excited about it, I guess. 
It's frustrating to be somewhere where it's a tourist area and that would be in any tourist town. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree. And and like my, I have a little girl and she goes to school in the next town over. And so in October, a five minute drive takes us a half an hour um, in the morning and on the way home. So of course there's a little bit of frustration there, but um, the local businesses in town really do thrive because of October. Um, and so I would never say that, like, I wish that people didn't come in October. I hope that Salem is really, truly becoming more of a four-season city. We are seeing more and more tourism throughout the year, which is amazing. And I hope that we get to a point where things get spread out a little bit more. So there's not this sudden, like, you know, impending uh, or this influx of people all of a sudden um, in October. But I kind of feel like, you know, with Halloween, that's probably not ever going to (laughs) happen. But it's really fun. It's a lot of fun. A client of mine gifted me a t-shirt that says, not every witch lives in Salem. Mm -hmm. Do you have t-shirts similar to that, but says something about, I'm a witch of Salem? I do not. That's actually my little like catchphrase that I use on TikTok. Um, Oddly enough is that's how I kind of like start my videos. I usually will say I'm a practicing witch and I live in Salem, Massachusetts, because I do think that living in Salem when you're a magical practitioner, it usually affords the practitioner, and, and I'm, I won't speak for everyone, but it usually affords you with some level of um, going public or being very open about your practice because it does feel so safe here and because it is not unusual for like somebody to be walking down the street wearing full ritual garb. That's something to like take note of too, is that obviously not everybody in every part of the world has that flexibility and freedom and safety attached to, you know, so openly being a witch. So I think, I mean, other than like looks and other than like what kind of clothes you wear, because obviously I I am also at the end of the day, still like a jeans and t-shirt person. So I'm not always, (laughs) not always wearing my ritual um, stuff. Yeah, I think here, more than other places, it's it's definitely safe to do that, safe to have those statement t-shirts and, and these sorts of things. Salem, Massachusetts is not typical of many places in the United States. What was it like in Canada living as a witch? Were you open there? I was open because of uh, my business. I wasn't always open in my community, although I did have a monthly meetup for other practicing witches and pagans and magical folks when I lived back in Canada that I ran. So at one point in time, I, I've been doing this since I was in high school and I always called myself something other than witch to like kind of make people feel more comfortable. You know, I'm kind of witchy, kind of spiritual, kind of this, kind of that. And once I went full time with my business, I was like, well, this is it. (laughs) This is my opportunity. And a lot of people didn't get it. And a lot of people like still don't understand it. Uh, I have family members that don't get it. Um, And I think that's okay, especially where I was living in Ontario and close to a big city like Toronto. There is a very kind of liberal mindset in terms of like, just not objecting to or um, arguing with a person's lifestyle choice. <laughs> so I never really got any like, I never felt like, unsafe there either. But it, all, it also didn't feel quite like the norm, like it would in Salem. In Salem, I feel like if you, you know, every, every fifth person is probably a, a witch or doing some sort of spiritual work. There's a lot of practitioners here. Lori Cabot is the official witch of Salem. Have you ever met her? That she is. I have not met her in person, although I do live very close to her shop. I had, the first time I ever visited Salem, I had brought a copy of her book, one of her books, and I was super excited to go and visit her shop and 
also disappointed when she wasn't there. And I was talking to one of the people who was working in the shop at the time. And I said, I have this book and I was really hoping she'd be here and I wanted her to sign it and this sort of thing. And he was like, well, just leave it to me and, and like come back in a couple days or, or whatever. Whenever you're before you leave, I'm sure she'll be here at some point and we'll get her to sign it for you. And she did. So I still haven't met her, but I have <laughs> I have this book that's like been signed by her. I hope I do get to meet her one day. That would be really cool. You'll have to take your picture with her. I would love that. Yeah, that would be really special. I believe it was Governor Dukakis who gave her an award and declared that she was the official witch of Salem. Do I have that correct? Is that accurate? I believe you're correct. Um, I know that that probably was the time period when she was given that title. I know she's been um, she's done a lot of amazing humanitarian work and a lot of teaching, even at like the university level. I just think that, you know, without her and without kind of what she got, what she started really in Salem, because even even 15 years ago, Salem was a very different place. Right. And it wasn't really until the 70s and until things kind of got started with the spiritual community here. So I think that what she did and 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 how she kind of paved the way forward for so many other practitioners to be coming into town and people to be opening shops in town, um, it's just amazing. And she, you know, she has a whole magical tradition that will carry on and forever be part of Salem. She's a pioneer. Definitely a pioneer. Yes. Just before our podcast, I was checking out your website. You know how you go to the grocery store and you're hungry and you just want to eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt when I saw your website. It's like, wow, this is all so delicious. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I noticed on your website, you have Modern Magic Academy. What is that? Yes. So Modern Magic Academy is the physical space. So I have my, um, my psychic readings, which are done virtually over Zoom. I do readings for people all over the world. I've been doing that for about five years professionally uh, and full time. And then Modern Magic was originally a space for me to just kind of take people in person and, and do my work here. And it is that. But um, we had found this space, which was just so perfect because it had two rooms in addition to this like office space that I could use for my readings. And so these rooms became modern magic kind of evolved <laughs> and became this education center and safe space for people to come for rituals. So we have a, a retail space that's it's very small, but I try to bring in specialty products that you might not find at other, um, other shops, um, smaller publishers and that sort of thing. And then we have our ritual room, um, which is where we do our classes and our, our witches circles. So those are usually on Fridays and Saturday nights. And um, one of the cool things about this space is that we've had an opportunity for people to reach out to us and say, hey, listen, like I'm coming to Salem with my coven. And it's certainly not going to be possible for us to like hang out. I mean, people do do this, hanging out in like a public park or something and, and performing a ritual. But we'd rather do it in, a, in a, a space and we'd rather have somebody there to maybe help us, guide us, et cetera. And so I've been able to hold space for other visiting witches and other covens even that are coming into town and wanting to do something special while they're here. I've even hosted like bachelorette parties and like women who are pregnant and about to have a baby just to, to bless and, and, and give those, uh, those closest to her opportunities to bestow blessings on her, her baby, like just be, like beautiful, amazing, incredible things that I used to have to rent out spaces to do this, like it, where I used to live. And now I have my own space. So this is just so, so special. What an incredible service you provide. <laughs> yeah, it's been like such a blessing. Who is your typical student at the academy? Yeah, um, a lot of different people come in, but I do notice it seems to be Primarily women, usually anywhere. Honestly, I, I wouldn't say there's like a specific age group um, of people that come in. It's anybody really between the ages of maybe like 20 and up. <laughs> Adult women, generally. Sometimes there's boyfriends that are tagging along or, or best friends or other men that are coming in who are just supportive or, or interested. Or um, I've even had um, somebody come in with their 
teenage daughter to learn about her practice and to see it represented. And it was a really, it was actually a minister who came in. So that was a really special thing that I was able to do to host somebody very open-minded, not like a very, (laughs) not an overly, you know, um, I guess, devotional sort of person, a very open-minded minister, but came in and was like, okay, what's all this witchy business? And uh, we were able to kind of let dad feel a little more comfortable about what his daughter was up to. What a terrific dad. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. But, you know, that's that obviously that's not always the case. And and so um, especially for people who are coming into town and visiting from somewhere else where maybe it's not safe to practice or we've had I had a visitor. This was in October who got quite emotional in this space because they hadn't out loud called themselves a witch before. That was really special. Did you help this person say it out loud? I gave the person permission to say it out loud, (laughs) but they made the choice. And I think that that was was a huge kind of um, release energetically for that person. That's so awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, it's like I said, it's just been so special to have, have the opportunity to do this. Tell us about your psychic readings. I'd love to. Yes. Um, Like I said, I've been doing this for professionally and full time for about five years now. And I do things a little differently than I think your average psychic reader would. As a witch, my concern with who I work with is, you know, whether or not they are wanting to transform certain areas of their life, whether or not they're looking to enhance certain areas of their life. And so with a psychic reading, I'll use various tools, whether it's tarot um, or connection with spirit. It's not always deceased people. Sometimes it's people's guides that come through. And then sometimes I'll I'll pull up a birth chart, an astrology birth chart, just to kind of cross-reference a few things that might be going on in a person's life. But all of that comes in so that we can kind of get to the root maybe of some things that somebody is looking to change or some areas that they're looking to advance in. Transformation has always been like a huge theme for me. And I've always loved that magic gives a person an opportunity to focus on those areas that they want to help co-create in their life. So a reading is a really great way for me to not only kind of look at the current energy of what's going on, and do some predictive work about what's possibly coming up in the future. But then to look at, all right, if we're not liking where things are going, you know, what is it that we can do to help shift things? How, how can we shift the energy in your life? And what is it going to take? And what do the cards have to say about what work needs to be done um, in order to get us there? So if any of the listeners want a reading from you, can they find you on your website and schedule an appointment? How does that work? Yeah. Yeah, they absolutely can. So modernmagicsalem.com is the website for all of our in-person events. We also do some virtual events. There's a, a monthly full moon circle that we offer only on Zoom. So you're not you're not hanging out with us while there's people here um, <laughs> in person. It would, it would just be um, over Zoom. But then you can book in to do an in-person reading here in Salem if you're coming to town. And then also my other business, which is called Highest Good Readings. I'm also on Instagram as um, at Highest Good Readings. That is where you can book in with me if you want to chat over Zoom. And as always, I'll put the links in the episode notes so that people can just click on them and find you. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just been kind of expanding with um within the readings and within teaching um i do like an annual modern witchcraft class which is all virtual so that's really cool because i'm able to kind of uh, have like students in australia which is weird because like they're on the other side of the the wheel of the year so sometimes that can get a little bit confusing but it's so much fun it's so much fun to connect with people Now in person, especially after all we went through with with COVID and everything, that's really truly how this all got all got started was with me trying to create community online. And then once we all got the green light, it was like, okay, we don't have any time to waste. People need community again. I'm under the impression that there are quite a few witches in Australia because I have followers from Australia 
we need to keep in mind that they are at the opposite season as us on the wheel. Yeah, they sure are. And that can be a, a little confusing as a teacher, right? Because sometimes if we're trying to like create something together or perform some sort of a ritual together, do something that's in relation to where we're at with the wheel of the year. What I think it reminds us of is the duality that's always present um, because, you know, sometimes it's Beltane versus Samhain, right? So there's this like really interesting thing, really interesting stuff that we can chat about even when we're all on kind of like opposite uh, opposite t- uh, places of that wheel. I can just imagine being an American and moving to Australia and how difficult that must be to get used to that calendar. Oh yeah, I would I would think that that would be that would be pretty confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the weather the weather probably shifts there too and it probably just is pr- present in in the land, right? I remember I had gone to Peru during our summer and they have winter there. And I remember it was dark (laughs) at four o'clock in the afternoon, but the stars (laughs) were amazing, more amazing than I've ever seen in the United States. Wow. I'd love to go uh, to Peru one day. I've never been to South America, so that would be really cool. That place is magical. I bet it is. There's so many magical spots. And I think Salem definitely is one of those places. I also love New Orleans. There's so many cool little Little hubs, little magical energy hubs, I feel There are a lot of witches in New Orleans, too. There sure are. (laughs) I had been to Salem when I was in the military. I was stationed at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, which isn't too far. It doesn't really exist anymore. They shut it down. But I used to go to Salem periodically, but it wasn't as commercial as it is now. They had the museum and just a few shops. Yeah, it's definitely growing and growing by the day. It's, I think, um, I don't know if witchcraft will continue to grow at the rate that it's growing right now, but I think that as we, as a society, become and hopefully continue to become more accepting of other belief systems and other ways of life, that um, more and more people will be in search of interesting and uh, kind of unusual things even if that's not part of their lifestyle, maybe more open to exploring. Because you see different, very different kinds of tourists come through Salem. It's either people who are really truly here for a spiritual sort of experience and retreat, whether they're really called to the land in terms of the history and feeling like there's um, some sort of healing uh, that can come from being present here in this space Um, And then, you know, you've got your history buffs, people who are coming through town and like the architecture and really want to learn about all of the famous happenings that have happened here. And then you've got your hocus pocus crowd who are here specifically for October and specifically to visit the places where that movie was filmed. And there are a lot of those people. (laughs) And then you have Halloween enthusiasts who are almost always only here in October, um, who are interested in the people who dress up as uh, Halloween characters, whether it's like, you know, Jack Skellington or Mike Myers or these kinds of like horror movie sort of things that we have on Essex Street. There's definitely something for everyone. Maybe something else to note, just because I I am in a lot of these kind of tourist groups for, for people who are planning to come into town is how many people get disappointed that there's nowhere to stay here in October. So if you are planning to come into Salem in October, you need to plan well, well in advance, like almost a year in advance. Like really, (laughs) we have a couple hotels in town and there's a handful of Airbnbs, but we're still a small town. Um, And so a a lot of people ask, where can I stay that's not Salem? And if you're coming in October, I really recommend that you don't stay more than like 10 or 15 minutes out of town or that you stay somewhere that's that you have access to the train so that you don't have to drive in and park because driving in and parking in October is insane. And then if you want to come in October, you need to book well in advance and you need to book everything you're going to do in advance, including your tours, including any museums that you're going to visit. If you want to come to to modern magic, you need to book in advance, all of those kinds of things, because 
things sell out really fast and there are lineups to get into every shop in town in October. So it's a busy, busy, busy time in town and a lot of people get really disappointed. They come into town and they're like frustrated that they can't sit down at a restaurant because nobody's taking reservations and you're going to get in a lineup and you're going to wait and line up for your lunch and all of these kinds of things. So it's so busy. We've, we have porta potties that are installed for the month of October around town. So it's very, when we say busy, it's like, it's very busy. And uh, I'll often hear people say, oh, I'm coming to town and I'm bringing my four children all under the age of five <laughs> and we're bringing a stroller and a wagon and this and that. And Salem is primarily a lot of the like tourist areas have cobblestone. So you have to be careful with all of those sorts of things as well. If Salem is your dream destination and as you've always wanted to come here, don't come in October. Or if you're coming in October, I wouldn't bring the kids. I personally wouldn't. It's just not I feel like it's 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 a frustrating environment for small children in October. Not that there's not things for kids to do. There are tons of things for kids to do. This is great advice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> people don't listen to it, though. They'll still be a massive ho a horde of people coming in October, but it's fine. I think just people need to know what they're getting into when they come here in October, especially on the weekends. Do you know how many witchy shops there are in Salem? <sighs> um, probably over 20, I would say, at this point. Maybe not over 20. Definitely over 10. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. And there's something for everyone, which is great. And you must not be the only reader. Oh, definitely not. And there's a bunch that come in during October alone. So they come to visit the readers? Well, there's a big psychic fair that happens in October. So there's people that visit from out of state just for that event. Some shops in town will hire on people seasonally and that sort of thing. Additional help for for all the readings in town. But, you know, definitely when it comes to picking a reader in town, you're going to want to get some references in terms of like anybody that you know who knows someone who's done a reading and it's been a good reading or if there's Google reviews about the person that you're doing a reading with because there's lots of great readers in town. But, you know, every now and then you will hear a story about one that wasn't so great. So just do your research. Pick somebody who you feel like you vibe with and whose practice seems in line with what you do. Yeah, I would just say have fun with it. This has been fun, Nicole Luna. This is wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> now we have met a real witch of Salem, Massachusetts. Yes. So yeah, you need to maybe design a t-shirt for all the witches in Salem. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that can be a winter project for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's when it gets quiet around town in the winter. All the shop owners and business owners are like, yeah, I'll save that for the winter. <laughs> you got like three months here where it's quiet and then it starts getting busy again. Yeah, I have the t-shirt that says not every witch lives in Salem that my client gave me. And then I also have a garden flag that says not every witch lives in Salem. Oh, cute. Yeah. Nice. And what state do you live in? I'm in Texas. Oh, wow. Very different vibe in Texas than in Massachusetts, I'm sure. It is a different vibe. You probably have a good community out in Austin area, right? Austin is fabulous for witches. Uh, I'm in the San Antonio area and it's really growing. We're getting more witchy markets, which is fabulous. Nice. Yeah. So we're growing. That's great. That's great. I think it, a lot of this is growing in many places right now, and just hopefully it will continue to be at least respected. Does I don't think everybody has to get on the witchy bandwagon, but at least it should be safe, right? Yeah, and we're normal people. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> we're just a little quirky, but we're normal people. Yes, absolutely. So I could go to the grocery store and no one would know I'm a witch. This is true. No one would know I was a witch either, unless I was wearing this t-shirt that says Big Witch Energy, <laughs> which I'll just wear around town because <laughs> nobody will think any, anything of it. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure and a real treat having you on my show, Nicole Luna. Oh, thank you so much. Blessed be. Blessed be. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us for Witch Casting with Theodora Pendragon. Have a burning question or have a topic you'd love Theodora and her guests to discuss on the show? Contact her through Instagram at Theodora Pendragon. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And help us spread the word by leaving us a rating and review and sharing it with your friends. See you next time and may your magic always shine. <laughs>